Hey guys, Jules here for WhatCulture.com and I want to talk to you today about the Justice League. And no, I'm not going to rag on it, but what I am going to do is tell you a tale of behind-the-scenes stories and projects that almost were, but unfortunately weren't. As today, we're going to have a chat about Justice League Mortal. Mortal was meant to premiere between 2008 and 2009 and originally had George Miller, aka the architect of Mad Max's Wastelands, at the helm and was at one point in time on track to be the first first genuine superhero ensemble to hit the big screen, well, that side of the Mystery Men, of course. And from all reports available, it was going to be a project that carried an aesthetic tone that was more in keeping with the animated series more than anything else, which understandably got fans excited. But where did it all go wrong? Well, in short, everywhere. But let's dissect it piece by piece and talk about what it promised to be, first of all. Those old enough to remember the beginnings of the comic book movie Boom during the mid-noughties will likely recall Warner Brothers taking something of a scattergun approach to adapting DC Comics. Christopher Nolan was midway through production on a sequel to Batman Begins, while Superman Returns had just debuted to a, well, less than favourable reception. It was during this time that the studio began to work on several projects, including a Flash movie directed by David S. Goyer, a Green Arrow film and a Wonder Woman feature helmed by Joss Whedon. All three projects would never see the light of day, but in their wake came an ambitious new project centred on DC's most famous union of superheroes, the Justice League of America. This project would eventually go on to become Justice League Mortal, with a script having been written by Kieran and Michelle Mulroney. Shortly thereafter, George Miller joined as a director, and Warner Brothers were pretty much rubbing their hands together with glee at the idea of this team-up spawning franchises and sub-stories of its own. An idea that led to casting calls going out to younger actors, as with sequels and other spin-offs in mind, the studio wanted to plan for the future. This meant that while Christian Bale was wowing audiences with his Batman, Army Hammer was approached to don the cowl in this version. Rounding out the other positions on the roster were Megan Gale as Wonder Woman, Common as Green Lantern, Adam Brody as THE Barry Allen, and the late Anton Yelchin as Wally West. And they would be going up against Maxwell Lord and Talia Al Ghul. So with the casting in place, let's talk about the story. And trust me, this is where it starts to get bloody weird. Whereas 2017's Justice League movie elected to tell a story focused around Jack Kirby's fourth world with the coming of Steppenwolf, Mortal decided instead to tell one that hit much closer to home, inspired by two key comic book stories, The Tower of Babel, penned by Mark Wade, and Infinite Crisis, written by Jeff Johns. Now, in all honesty, these films have more than enough content to be counted as their own very separate movies. The Tower of Babel is a tale that focuses on Batman falling prey to his own countermeasures. You see, because of his concern that one day his allies might turn against the world that they currently protect, he began to build files, information, and tactics in order to defeat them if they went rogue. This unfortunately falls into the hands of Ra's al Ghul and is used systematically to take down the team, all the while throwing seeds of dissent into their ranks. It's pretty much the definitive book about Batman's relationship with the Justice League, and it makes perfect sense as to why it was chosen to start things off with a bang. However, that's not to say that Infinite Crisis is a slouch either, because this story sees a virus turn people into superhero hunting weapons become unleashed, which, as you can imagine, spells trouble for our friends within the Justice League. Both stories were going to be fused together to create Mortal, and from the details that have been released and uncovered, it was going to be pretty mad. For starters, it actually opens with the funeral of a League member, before flashing backwards two days in order to introduce each member of the League individually. Bruce Wayne is monitoring the world through Brother Eye before he attends a party with Maxwell Lord and Talia Al Ghul. From that point forward, it becomes clear that someone is targeting DC's heroes and that they all know about their respective weaknesses, which eventually leads to the formation of the League itself. So, nice and easy so far, right? Well, buckle up kids, because here we go. The team then discovers that Lord is behind the attacks, but he manages to take control of Superman before they can stop him. Supes then goes on a one-man warpath against his fellow teammates resulting in a confrontation between himself and Wonder Woman that sees them fighting everywhere, from the moon to the depths of the Hudson River. That sounds pretty brilliant, right? And according to the prelim notes, it was going to go a long way to make every character feel fleshed out. However, there were some unconventional, shall we say, creative decisions included as well. Instead of Wonder Woman being the one to kill Maxwell Lord as she does in the comics, that honour goes 
to Batman. Lord somehow survives this, but it's interesting and possibly worrying that this team up was going to show Batman breaking his one rule. I mean, we all saw how mad people got when Superman snapped Zod's neck, so Lord knows what was going to happen here with that happening. The climax then sees Barry Allen sacrifice himself to destroy Lord's army of Omax, seeding Wally West's eventual journey to becoming a member of the League, before the team reunify to fight Starro, who, as we all know, was their very first adversary in the comics. As you can tell, while there is a lot of cool stuff going on, it's a, it's a bit messy in parts. However, with Miller at the helm, there was a massive amount of potential for Mortal. It's just a shame that while the ink was drying, he was getting a bit weird with his talent. According to numerous sites, Miller deployed a whole host of methods to get them in shape for their roles, and played mind games with Army Hammer specifically in the hopes of getting a genuinely paranoid Batman on screen, which the actor recounted to Ain't It Cool News in 2010. He, talking about Miller, was going so in-depth in this. We had a brain surgeon, a psychiatrist, a Joseph Campbell expert, and all of these people in every single table meeting we had for a month and a half, and then all of the characters were also training as their characters. So The Flash, Adam Brody, was training as The Flash with rubber bands, so that he'd be fast and twitchy. Aquaman was swimming a lot, and Miller would send him to go swim with dolphins in Northern California for hours so that he'd be used to being around sea creatures. Batman, being the only human of the Justice League and having to really really prove himself there, he had to be a consummate martial artist as well as the ultimate detective, so he was playing psychological games with all of us. He would leave me out of things, like intentionally, but I wouldn't know this until months later when I would just get the feeling of, what's going on? Because he wanted me to constantly be getting into that paranoid mind frame of the Batman. Now, to be honest, this type of training actually sounds really intriguing. A little mean-spirited for Hammer, maybe, but it could have produced something truly special for the Justice League's team dynamic. But unfortunately, Justice League Mortal became a victim of the 2007 Hollywood writers' strike, which delayed production for several months. Come 2008, and the film was set to begin production, only for progress to be derailed again, this time by the Australian Film Commission. Miller, himself an Australian, wanted to film Mortal entirely down under, which would have brought dozens of jobs and millions of dollars to the country, but his attempts were eventually scuppered by the film commission, who felt as though there weren't enough Australians in the main cast to qualify Warner Brothers for a 40% tax rebate. Production had already been delayed by several months at this stage, but Warner Brothers were still determined to meet the film's original premiere date of summer 2009. However, production was subsequently shifted to Vancouver, by which point The Dark Knight then released, fundamentally altering the comic book movie landscape. The rampant success of this film caused the studio to shift their strategy in order to focus on solo superhero movies instead. In this respect, the success of The Dark Knight meant that we ended up with the Green Lantern solo film. Brilliant. Thanks for that. By the time that The Dark Knight came around and The Dark Knight Rises was basically ready to start shooting, Warner Brothers decided there was little sense in pursuing Miller's Justice League, which had suffered countless delays by that point and seemingly threatened to step on the toes of Christopher Nolan's Batman trilogy. This was something of a bugbear to Warner Brothers, because they'd already shelved a Bruce Wayne origin story due to fears the audience would get confused by the idea of there being two Batmen. And though Smallville managed to survive Superman Returns, it likely only managed to do so due to its followers as well as the fact that it already had been running for five years by the time that the film had released. Point being, although Mortal had a lot of traction for a period of time, its eventual cancellation wasn't as surprising as it probably should have been. Warner Brothers have never been keen on the idea of multiple incarnations of a character appearing on the screen at once, which is why, even today, Gotham isn't allowed to explicitly reference Joker or Harley Quinn. And to cap it all off, the sheer monetary investment was the bullet to the film's parents as it ballooned to an estimated $300 million thanks to the delays, and it was something that Warner Brothers simply didn't want to put up with after Superman Returns had quite, well, tanked just two years earlier. So that was that. However, we've got to look at what Mortal could have been, as in many respects it was so ahead of the curve that it could have changed how we perceived shared cinematic universes today. People often say that DC was playing catch-up to Marvel with their interconnected films, but if Mortal had dropped, we'd be singing a different tune. Say what you want about Mortal's up-and-down story, you can't deny the film wasn't without a clear vision, a unique cast, and a desire to create a universe that would have informed subsequent sequels and spin-offs. Great care had gone into the process, 
success, and choices like getting younger actors to keep the franchise going for longer were incredibly smart moves. Unfortunately though, it just wasn't to be. Miller would go on to helm Mad Max Fury Road, the DC Universe would eventually come into play in its own way, and DC is still looking ahead of ways of expanding that universe. Yet it's so interesting to think that if Nolan didn't do such a good job, and that Mortal had been a bit luckier and without delays, then we could have been looking at an entirely different superhero landscape.